us separate us. Well, we've been sep we've been separated from nature since the very beginnings of our myth Western mythology. Uh, Hercules killed all the animals, cleaned out the stables. That's what the hero is supposed to do: is kill off the animals. Moses uh, killed twenty thousand. Kill, you know, was against the golden calf. The people were going to worship the golden calf when he was up there getting the commandments or talking to God or whatever he was doing up there. And uh, when he came down, they had been worshiping an animal. So he separated God from animal. Previously in Egypt and there were many other cultures, God and animal were one. This was finished with Moses, finished with Hercules, finished with Gilgamesh. So the very beginnings of our consciousness have to do with separating it from the animal. That's nature. Well, we can't be separate from nature. We are nature. I mean, our cells are alive, our nerve fibers are alive, and the minerals in us keep a, Don't we take minerals every morning to keep healthy? What are those minerals? They are also must in some way be nature. Calcium and magnesium. I mean, it's ridiculous that the, the minerals that we pour into ourselves thinking this is not animated. So do you think that we're able to have a consciousness shift? Because being separate from nature, obviously that hasn't served us very well. And it seems that there have been fundamental consciousness shifts in the past about how we relate to nature. So are we able to do that? Are we able to have a reconciliation with nature? You know, talking about nature is very difficult. There, there are 60 definitions of the word nature. So what we're talking about sometimes is an idealized image of I don't know what. But even to think that we're separated from nature is somehow a thought thinking disorder. You can't be separated from nature. Why we think that way is the interesting thing, not whether we are or are not. It's what happens in the mind that likes to think that it's separated from nature. Does that mean that the mind or the human being thinks he's now more free, or that the human being thinks he's now uh, superior? In other words, what does it do for you to think you're separated from nature? So what does it do for you? What does it do for you? Well, it gives you a sense of superiority. That's number one. Number two, that you can control it. You can put a dam on a river, and you can chop down a tree, and you can do any damn thing you want to do because you're not nature. And that idea goes back to Descartes, you know, where the world is a flat res extensa, extended stuff, and the mind is where the soul is. So. You know, Descartes created litter. There'd be no litter in the world. He made the world dead, soulless. And uh, so being separated, it turns the world into litter, waste matter, products for human use. That's the advantage of thinking this way. And look what it did. We had three, four hundred years of industrialization and colonialization and deforestation and everything else that's highly successful from the point of view of a separated from nature person. Now we're suffering the uh, backlash. And to deal with the backlash, can you describe the backlash though first? The backlash. The backlash is disease, disorder in humans. The back, just the backlash in humans. The the slow collapse of our sustaining systems. And this has very little to do with the fact that we proudly point to our, uh, our uh, longevity pattern, that we're now living longer than our grandfathers. That's, that's not evidence of the backlash. That's an attempt to justify the destruction. The backlash, the backlash is really, again, psychological, that we are in, so inflated that we've lost touch with reality. And how, where, because this is a, a, a problem, given the biosphere, can you discuss the chasm in our thinking between the importance of the biosphere and how it sustains us and our actions in, in basically killing off the things that sustain us? 
Can you talk about that gap and why it exists? We're sort of a denial of death in a way of the, the systems that sustain life. The and, and then what is the cure for that? So we can ask that question. Now. The denial of what's real, when I say what's real, I mean the actual dependence of human life on air, water, food, soil, sunlight, temperature, the fundamental simple things that we depend upon. They are one after another being, or have been, um, I won't say destroyed, but permanently damaged. Our air, our water, and so on. Let, let alone the animals with which we live and which we eat. Since we're up top on the food chain, or have been for a while, uh, may not last, um, we are destroying as we move forward with our superiority the very basis on which that superiority rests. And the prognosis, unless there is a change, is that we eat up or destroy or, no lo or suffocate the things that keep us going, keep human life going. See, all of this, though, is from the point of view of the human. This is anthropocentric. I'm not sure even that makes sense. That's one of the fundamental things that has to change, is that we are not at the top of the pile or in the center of the universe. So in order to save ourselves, what do we have to do? Well, you know, I'm a therapist, so I'm very careful about using words like saving. And so I'm not really talking about saving or salvation or any of that. I'm talking much more about waking up to common sense. It's, it's just a matter of realizing how dependent you are on taking a deep breath or how dependent you are upon where your, your glass of water. And if that is lost, then you are in some kind of... Um, irreal world, delusional world. So it's that, waking up to the insanity of the way we have structured ourselves, rather than doing something in the world to make a change. That's the old style American way, let's fix it. I'm not talking about fixing it, I'm talking about making a change in the mind that realizes, my God, I'm crazy. That's great. great. <laughs> Can I ask a follow-up yes, question? Please do. So what, if you could name a couple of things or one in our culture that has emphasized this insanity, this illness, what would it be? Money. Can you, Can you rephrase the question and then say, Can you and say then, then, I feel you're going to say that because yeah. we follow on to that with the Can you discuss the Okay, let me just shift extent. myself a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Are we into capitalism? Yes, yeah, so if you could rephrase <laughs> the thing that has thing caused that our illness as capitalism money. or whatever. Money. You know, Just money. say money. Well, money, it's not money's fault. No, no, I, I don't want to blame our tragedy on money. Uh, it could be something profound in human, in human nature, which is greed or ex expansionism or growth some strange factor. Maybe we are a virus in the whole system. Maybe we're not really, don't really belong. Maybe this self-destruction or, or human destruction that seems to be uh, running at a fast pace, as if we're all running towards the finish line on purpose, maybe there's a reason. Maybe we really have ruined things and are not, uh, not serviceable anymore. That's one possibility. But what would make us unserviceable? Could it be the, this furor agendi, the rage to do, the rage to do, to make, to expand, to take hold, to own, to possess? Is that only a Western drive? Is that an all-human drive? It seems not to be an all-human drive when you look at some tribal societies that have lived 50, like the Aborigines in Australia, they've lived 50, I don't know, 50,000 years without getting into that. 
Uh, we would say they haven't been living very well, though. Uh, I think below money, below capitalism, is this greed, which capitalism somehow feeds or makes into a virtue. Let's put it that way. Makes it into a virtue. There's more to say about capitalism, I'm I mean, sure. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could, if you want to keep going on Yeah, that. keep going on Yeah, you may, you know, I may wander a little bit, but then you can, yeah. There's different aspects of capitalism that we're interested in. It's like consumption and media and advertising and, you know, there's the economic system of it. And, and competition. Like, that's a big piece of it. Are we that idea of competition. Sorry, sorry. But, well, let me think now what I want to do saying. here. Well, we were talking about capitalism and greed, basically the underlying drive, human drive yeah. is greed. Yeah. Um, and there's also just the, dis I think we're talking about how we are and how things have become how they've become. And there's also this hope that, you know, this sort of, what do we do now? I know you don't like the word denial, but in this state. No, we have to use that word denial okay. because then I want to do something with okay, it. Okay, great. So maybe you're But gonna... before we get there. Okay. Um, You know, there was a book that came out a long time ago called Protestantism and the Rise of Capitalism by a man named Tawney. And he shows that capitalism developed and became the dominant faith of Western people at this parallel to the rise of Protestantism. And the virtue of each person on his, I'm saying his because that's what it was then, his own, and owning. And owning gives you the right to do whatever the hell you want to do with what's yours. And that is a Protestant strength of ego. I am captain of my own ship and nobody's going to push me around and watch out for the law of eminent domain and this is my land and you get the hell off and so on. So if I want to cut down the trees on my land they don't belong to the common which was one of the older ideas in New England anyway uh, but they belong to me. So the exaggeration of me in our psyches goes along with the development of capitalistic power. It's not exactly as Marx thought, that is, it's the ownership of the means of production, because the means of production are, are now managed by managers who don't necessarily own it at all. They just, they just manage it for supposedly, I think, for political power not, and, and personal gain. That's different. It's the sense of own, my own. And psychotherapy's turned this whole thing into you're supposed to own all your feelings, own everything you've said, and we continue to build this personal owner. That's the root of the capitalism that we have today, so that we then feel threatened with anybody, anything, any people, any move that would take some of that away, like you want to govern my trees, my waste, my this, my that, you're infringing on me. Can I, so yeah. would a sustainable world, a, a, would an orient, human mental orientation mm -hmm. in the direction of sustainability completely subvert that, that me consciousness? It's more of a we consciousness. Is that true? I think something more is needed than the idea of sustainability. I think sustainability is faulted for one big reason. It's still somehow an economic idea. And I think economics, as I've been trying to say for some time now, is an insane faith that justifies everything we do. We do it because we justify what we do and we... Um, we, we explain what we do in terms of economics. Let's set that aside. What would make you want not to destroy something would be your sense, your appreciation of its beauty. If we start with the world as a beautiful, as something beautiful, we would want, what do you do with anything beautiful? You fall in love with it. 
and by falling in love with the world, you want to keep it around. And that's the simplest answer to the problem of what of the world. It's a the Greeks thought that the word cosmos, meaning the whole thing, the whole bag, really was a an aesthetic term. It meant orderly, beautifully, uh, carefully, um, considerately. It, 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 and it was closer to the word for, for cosmetics than it is to the word cosmonaut. In the Greek world, it meant an adornment. So the world, the cosmos was an adornment, something extraordinarily beautiful that you could see in the night sky, you could see in, in a forest, you could see in a, anywhere in a person, in the way the hair falls on a woman, the way a, a man moves his hands when he's working, what, whatever. It could be anywhere at all. And that was the cosmos showing itself. It displays. Now once we reawaken our aesthetic sense and are not anesthetized, as we are, by all the distractions, if we were not anesthetized, we would be able to see and appreciate the beauty in the world. Now the moment there's beauty, you fall in love with beauty. That's, that's Plato, but it's also our own experiences. You see a beautiful man or a beautiful woman and you fall in love with them. That's the first bit of attraction. And if you fall in love with something, love the world, not through Christian moralism about you must love the world, or an economic one, it's sustainability for our own benefit, therefore we'll live longer. That is not it. It's got to be something much more profound that touches the heart. And it touches the heart if you, if you realize that our job on the earth is to love it, to fall in love with it. Not just to love it, you must love the world, but to fall in love with it. And you only fall in love with it if you're aesthetically alive to it. Huh. Wow. Or just can we talk about why we're not in love with the world right now? Well, we're, you know, we're not in love with the world now because we're anesthetized. Uh, Robert J. Lifton has a great thing about psychic numbing. We're psychically numbed. I mean, we, we numb our senses from morning till night, whether it's with noise or loud music or light at night uh, so that you never see the night sky or whether it's with a glass of ice water before you eat. You've numbed your mouth. You've, it, you, we don't smell. We don't, we don't, we're anesthetized. Uh, I'm leaving out the pharmaceutical industry, but that's all a business of anesthetization or changing the, our sensation stuff. Uh, the schools don't teach art or music. Uh, I just read recently that kids are not allowed to have recess in Georgia, little kids, in school, because they might fall down, scrape their knee, and then there'd be a lawsuit. They've cut recess out of the school. So everything is to keep the senses stopped, shut down. So nobody sees the beauty. We're not any longer appreciators. Our definition of the human being now has become uh, homo sapiens, we know, or homo, God knows, all kinds of things, you know, homo faber, we make things. I think our point is homo aestheticus. I think the human being is on the planet in order to appreciate it. That's all. You don't have to do anything with it. You have to appreciate it. And what you do with it should add to its beauty. Beautiful. I, love, I think the, the soul cries when you hear the, about the arts and the music yeah. and the desensitization because yeah. it's true, especially in a place like LA. You know, which yeah, we should go we, there. We will get <laughs> to Los Angeles. Uh, now we're just taking a little a little stretch. Yeah, a little stretch. Do you want to have some water? Uh, good idea. I get dry quickly. I'm talking fast too. No, you. That's, a, that's, that's the myth that is presented as science. That we have to remember that. The myths are, are more actual in our lives than some of the things we think are the truth because those things change every six or every generation or two generations. But the myths are, continue always the same stories. The hero kills the animals and separates from nature and sets up the human kingdom that goes on and on and on, one way or another.
Okay, do you so mean, let's okay. pick up on the, the idea of the loss of beauty and love. Mm -hmm. And um, this um, side question, but there must be a deeper sadness to that. Oh my. And can we talk about that? And is that what, what, what's, is the, that? You know, the loss of, uh, the loss that I was talking about there, the loss of beauty, the loss of appreciation or the, uh, what we do have left though is a feeling of loss. Something's missing. Something's missing in our lives. And there's some statistic done by some marvelous statistician, sociologist, anthropologist, that we are only at rank 27 in the category of societies that's happy. Yet we have sub-zero fridges and Viking ranges and hybrid cars and all the rest, but we're not happy. And our job, you know, in America is the pursuit of happiness. It doesn't mean chasing after happiness, by the way. I think it means that is our pursuit. The pursuit, th that is our task, is the work of happiness. Well, there's no happiness without the sense of beauty and without somehow or another being in love with life. <laughs> that is really great. <laughs> I think I'll start crying. Um, do you want to talk about So because yeah. there's this deeper sense of loss, there must be a denial because we are supposed to be happy, aren't we? So are we in a state of denial or do you want to bring Well, how are we reacting to that loss? Yeah. Like how, what, what are the psychological responses to well, this we kind of unnameable loss? Yeah. If, if we've lost the feeling of the beauty of the world, then we are looking for substitutes. Eric Hofer said, you can never get enough of what you don't really want, meaning we rush around buying stuff, needing stuff, permanently needy, needing therapists, needing love, needing relationships, needing holidays, needing vacations, and you deserve it says the ads, and you deserve it because you're miserable. You're depressed. So now the government has, or the health service has shown, you can read a questionnaire and find out that you're depressed, even if you don't really know it or feel it. You can, it can be discovered, and then you can take medication against it. That's all, maybe that's a side issue. But the, the loss, the feeling of loss, is that we don't know what it is we've lost, and that's what I've been trying to emphasize is what we've lost is the is, is the beauty of the world and we we make up for it with attempting to conquer the world or own the world possess the world right. mm -hmm. um, just for the camera can you discuss the basic concepts of eco psychology because it seems to be an extraordinarily important new movement I wrote that some time ago. <laughs> um, if he wants to know. <laughs> the basic idea is that we don't know where the psyche stops. Does it stop in my head and my skin? Everything inside is psyche. Or is it in interrelationships between two people? Or is it in the room where there are, is it only human beings? In other words, where does the psyche stop? Now, perhaps it doesn't stop anywhere. Maybe there's an old Greek idea of the anima mundi, the soul of the world. And maybe the psyche is extended through all things. Philosopher Whitehead said, nature alive. Maybe there is psyche even in stones and in rocks and rivers and oceans and so on and so forth. Echo psychology assumes that the psyche is not only inside human beings or in between in relationship with human beings. That's it. It's not intrapsychic or interpsychic, but it is somehow we are in the psyche rather than the psyche in us. That's the basic idea of echo psychology. Therefore, you can look at the entire uh, world, all the phenomena of the world, as also psychic events. 
as and sold. It seems uh, evident that if the world is deteriorating and the soul is also in the world, then you are you are deteriorating and I am deteriorating. That they become it becomes uh, inextricably connected. We have lived the insanity that we are disconnected. That we can do what we want and the world can go its own merry ways, its own destructive ways, whatever ways. But this is a, as I say, this is the backlash we're beginning to realize it doesn't work that way. The Greeks know, knew this. Uh, the, the soul in Plato, for example, was something that we partook in. So whatever happened outside was happening inside. The microcosm, the macrocosm were so related that whatever you did to yourself, you were doing to the world. Whatever you're doing to the world, you were doing to yourself, in the sense that you were doing to the soul of the self and the soul of the world. But we lost the word souls, except in you know cemeteries or churches on Sunday. We don't, oh well, no, it came back. Fortunately, the word soul came back with soul music, soul food, soul brother, soul sister, so came out of the street again, left the cemetery and came back through the streets. One of the most impressive moments of recent history was the, uh, the flooding at, in New Orleans. It was the sense of enormous, unbelievable suffering of so many people who carried that flood, and I'm talking about the black people on the roofs, the black people crowded into the stadium, all those images we saw on TV, this incredible dignity and strength of soul that these people had in the face of neglect, contempt, uh, confusion, uh, never mind that side, we've had enough of the political aspects of that. I want to emphasize what we saw. We saw a people who have been suffering for 150 years at least in the United States, if not longer, much longer, who carried five days of neglect and, 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 and natural torture, couldn't eat, couldn't drink, couldn't get out, with such beauty and such dignity that it made me think that all along, how have they had the strength of soul to support the lynchings from trees, the abuse in the bus stations, the, the fear that goes with just being alive in a white world? How did they do this? What is this strength of soul? And uh, I was just now in, in Kentucky talking to Bell Hooks for four days about some of, about some of this. We're doing another film on this. So it interests me enormously. What is it that the blacks have that we need? Because if our white culture now is beginning to go down, demographically the, the change of, of who's being born and immigration and and the, the fact that in California there are now more people who are not white than are white being born or whatever the statistics are. We know this white world is of that there's a new miscegenation going on and that this is changing radically. So we're not going, we have to learn if the world is going down, if we're on the Titanic, we have to learn how to survive with beauty and dignity and strength of soul that they had at Katrina. We have to learn from them. The whole idea of integration has to change. It's not that we have to work, we white people, at integrating them, integrating the others, teaching them uh, our English and our, all these things. We have to learn how to integrate from them. They know things we don't know. They know how to survive in adversity. They know how to maintain dignity, charity, love, art, music, body culture, all kinds of things, movement I'm talking about. They know things we don't know. We're ugly, and we don't know, as Graham Greene said, the ugly American. We don't know how ugly we are. And they 
are ways of learning there. That Kat That's the lesson of Katrina for me, is a radical reintegrate, rethinking of integration in terms of strength of soul and the ability to survive in real adversity. Well, I have one more uh, little piece on the ugliness. Okay. And that is, one day it occurred to me that the arrival of our troops in the Middle East, uh, where, especially in the Shiite world, where poetry is so enormously important and where over the loudspeakers and the bazaars in Persia, for example, in Iran, they recite poetry all the time, uh, that the arrival of our troops, our chunky troops, with all our equipment and our shaved heads and bodies and you know, the, way, the way they look, is, it's like an aesthetic insult. There could be one of the causes of war can be is, is aesthetic insult. We are, we are the ugly American arriving on the scene. And just our being there, even with goodwill and handing out money and doing with all our good intentions, can be insulting to a culture where something else is of, of more value than equipment. Our muscular grunts are not enough in a culture that is deeply connected to language and uh, rhetoric and, and poetry and imagination. In other words, why is it that we don't, or not why is it, but we use the word for denial. We use the word denial for explaining uh, that we're paying no attention to what's Basically, going on. Like things are yeah. falling apart and we're not Things everything. are falling apart and we don't, we play football. Exactly. So, the current term for what's wrong with the American public in regard to the world falling apart, in regard to the political uh, corruption and so, is denial. We're in denial. Now, denial is a term that came out of Freudian psychoanalysis. It's one of the de eight defense mechanisms. Uh, that means we repress what we don't, that we, we find unpleasant, that we can't accept in consciousness. We repress, deny its existence. But I think denial was not just discovered, you know, by Freud. I think that the American habit of not wanting to know about what's unpleasant or simply being able to exclude from consciousness anything at all is to protect the American mind and keep it innocent. Innocence is the real root of our difficulty. You know, Mark Twain... In, wrote a book about innocence. Uh, Henry James's novels have American innocence over in Europe, Daisy Miller and others who, who don't know anything and who are just, not, not just unsophisticated, but who, whose virtue is their childlikeness. That's what's so great about the American, uh, we're the young country, and even as we grow old, we have no mentor. The men they're not mentors because they don't have anything to teach anybody. They're still as innocent as they were when they were 16. One of the statistics that will horrify anybody is that they have asked a large population in America, at what age would you like to be all your life? And a large percentage, the largest group of, of uh, men wanted to be between 16 and 20. Some men wanted to be younger than 16, and some men wanted to be three or four for the, their entire lives. When they asked women, women wanted to be a little bit older, maybe 18 to 21. Now that is not denial, that's a cult of innocence, staying in high school for your entire life. So love, dating, sex, abortions, problems of, of, uh, of uh, pleasure, uh, food, eating, the whole thing is part of staying in high school your entire life. So, so the, cult of the cult of innocence really is 
the strength of America. It keeps us, this young country, always on the go, always ready for change, always out there getting new stuff. That's part of high school is you get new stuff and you envy other people's stuff and you move in a group and peer, peer, peer opinion is more important than any, a teacher's opinion. Very important, that one. So how are you going to get a mentor or learn anything? Because you're not supposed to. You're supposed to stay young and fresh and get those bumps taken out of your skin and out of your breasts and out of your butt and keep as, as youthful as possible. But it isn't only the cult of youth. It's the cult of innocence, not knowing. Me? I don't know. I don't know how this happened. That's not my bit. I don't know. That's the big thing. I don't know. And I don't want to know. I want to stay willfully ignorant. And behind that, I'm afraid to say, I believe, is the worship of the Christ child. You know, the idea of you're not supposed to know. The Catholics were taught not to read the Bible. They should follow the dogma and the priest. The Protestants were taught to read the Bible, but to connect to God directly. And God loved them directly. So you didn't need to know anything in between you and God. So you've got this, this sense that innocence, innocence is holiness, innocence is virtue. The less, the less worldly you are, the less street smarts you are, the, le less, um, uh, the less complicated you are, the more virtuous. God will love the simple, and a little child shall lead them. You know, these quotations in the Bible that are in the New Testament and the Old Testament too, but particularly the New Testament, are horrible. They are to keep you stupid. There's all kinds of healing, you know. There's Some healing requires the patient to die first in, in symbolic sense. Maybe the only healing is radical shock. Uh, maybe the healing is very gradual, where the wound moves step by step and getting a little smaller every day, a little less painful every day, a little less deep every day. That's another kind of healing. I see. Well, the healing of our consciousness probably takes what we've noticed again and again in our public press, that is, wake up. And that's what Socrates said and the Buddha says and so on, the, to awaken. Have you noticed how often the press says, it's another wake-up call. We keep having a wake-up call. That's what 9-11 was, was a wake-up call. For God's sake, it takes that to wake us up. You know, you have to blast the Twin Towers to wake us up. And that didn't do it. Didn't do it. Paul Revere ran around trying to wake people up. That's one of the early myths of America. Wake up, wake up, wake up. The British are coming. Doesn't matter who's coming, what's coming. We don't wake up. So we're, we're uh, committed to staying um, asleep or staying in Plato's cave or staying innocent. So healing is not something very easy. It may take catastrophe. It may take that idea that uh, of 500 monkeys. It may take an enormous amount of change before there's that awakening. Maybe it is actually happening. Maybe there is an awakening going on in small places by individual people all over, I'm thinking now of the United States, but all <coughs> over doing small, maybe the healing's already going on in the sense that there is a waking up in many people, in tiny places, in regard to all kinds of things, whether it's what they're doing with their recycling, to what they're doing with animals, what they're doing with their own gardens, what, they're do, what the campaigns that they enter, politically, there's so much change of that kind that I think that kind of change of consciousness is happening. There is a waking up. Now, but I, uh, now there could be a change of consciousness, but let's watch out that we start hoping. Hope doesn't do it. Hope, you know, the, the thing, hope, do not hope for hope, will so on and so forth. Both St. Paul talks about watch out for hope. T.S. Eliot picks it up again in Four Quartets, watch out for hope. Why? You know the story, the myth, the Greek myth about hope? It's well, well worth knowing. Pandora had a little box, right? 
and in this box or jar or something were all the evils of the world, and the lid was on there real tight, and then she was curious, so she lifted the lid up and they flew out. And you see Greek images of this in, in their paintings, and these little bits of hope, or uh, little bits of evil are flying all over the world, so you find evil everywhere, different kinds of evil. But at the last minute she clapped the lid back on and trapped one, the last evil left, and that was called Elpis, or hope. Not Elvis, Elpis, hope. So hope is inside, not out there, and it's one of the evils. And why is hope an evil? It's because it projects you forward and takes you away from what is. You keep thinking, well, it's getting better. Well, it's not getting better. Well, it's so-and-so. Well, it's it's, they'll do it, I can see a new dawn coming. No, if you live in that new dawn coming, you miss what's actually in front of you and what has to happen. And I know that from being a psychoanalyst for so many years. You don't talk about what, whether it's getting better or not getting better or where it's going or what this dream might mean in the future and our addiction to the future in the United States. We have a real addiction to futurology. It's much more being attentive to what really is right now. And you work on that, and you don't need any hope. You're just working on it. Negative impact. What is your opinion of the car, its negative impact? Okay. Socially, psychologically, <coughs> environmentally. You know, about, automob about cars, because I like to call them automobiles, and I'll tell you why I call them automobiles. Uh, it's not... Uh, the negative impact and how we have to fix the highways or set up more public transportation. I, I agree with all those plans. Uh, and the car problem is being resolved partly by hybrids and diesels and so on and so forth. That isn't the thing. The thing is, what's the psychological push in the American soul that wants its car? Well, what is it to have the wheel in your hand? Just start with that. What is the wheel? The wheel is fate, destiny, one of the greatest symbols ever is holding the wheel in your own hands. That's number one. Number two, what is an automobile? It means a self-moving, automobile, a self-mover. That is the earliest first definition in Christian thought of God. God is a self-mover from Aristotle to St. Thomas when you hold the wheel in your hands, you are God. And you are a God in the old sense of having huge horsepower under your foot. So you're Phython in his chariot, you're, you're riding Pegasus. This is what it is to sit behind the wheel, hold the wheel in your hand, and get started. The starter. Just think of that word starter, what that means. Ignition. Think what that word means. The car is much more than a problem. It is a deep piece of the American psyche, and it is a, it is a symbol of huge significance. To get people out of their car, even carpooling is difficult, because when you're in the carpool, you're a passenger. You don't have the wheel in your hand, and passengers are tied to the word passive and a whole lot of other things. You're taken for a ride. It's... it's completely different thing to be a passenger in a carpool than it is to be have that car in your, that and there are 300 and something like 67 varieties of American cars whether they sell or not isn't the point but can you imagine that notion of choice each one of those offers me my chance to be as close to God as I'll ever get by having that wheel in my hand I like the idea of future generations. I don't like the idea of future. I like thinking in terms of the biblical unto the seventh generation. That ties one much more closely to the earth and what happens to the earth, what you're doing in regard to the earth so that it persists into the seventh generation. And it's much, it's farther removed from thinking about the future, which tends to be an abstract um, intellectual thing, whereas the next generation and the next generation involves burials, or it involves the sense of a generation dying and the next one coming on. So 
thoughts of what I would like the, the generations to come to think about is the generations to come, that they keep on thinking of continuity. They think about, about maintenance. They think about long-term things. They think about, uh, and they act in terms of long-term things. And that's the seventh generation. And that they remember some of the warnings, such as unto the seventh generation, a sin or a mistake or a crime has consequences for a long term. That is neither future thinking nor long term thinking. It's thinking very practically in terms of a move. You make a move that the consequences of it are thought about in regard to the generations to come. Thank you. <coughs> One of my difficulties with therapy is that it, it has internalized some of the most basic emotions like rage and, uh, and fear. You know, you couldn't live a day if you didn't have fear because you couldn't cross the street. You, you, you'd miss the... But therapy calls fear or internalizes it and it becomes anxiety. And anxiety has no object. So fear is essential for recognizing what there is in the world to be afraid of, whether it's political or, you know, from the cops or from criminals or from uh, decay of, of our social structures or our environmental structures, there are things to be afraid of, and you should be afraid. If you're not afraid, and if it's called anxiety, you think there's something wrong with you, I'm, I'm anxious. But I'm not anxious, I'm actually afraid of what the government could do. I'm afraid of the trees dying. This makes me afraid, and that is a taking the emotion out from inside and as anxiety and placing it in its concrete reaction to the world. It's very similar to the, to the one of rage. You know, uh, what is this rage I feel over so much that happens? Well, if I take it to my therapist and we talk about it as, you know, I'm hostile, I'm angry, I, whatever happened to me in the past, I have a lot of emotion that so but maybe the rage is outrage maybe it wants to be out maybe it is a political reaction to the world to what's going on uh, Aristotle said a very famous sentence uh, man is by nature a political animal now we look in therapy at a person and say he's, he's a sexual animal or he's a relational animal or whatever and that work we go, at, we go at. But do we go at his being a political animal and that part of his instinctual life is political? And if that instinctual life isn't paid attention to, he can be disordered. You've got to be political to be a full animal being. And to be a full animal being means you have to know when you're afraid of the government or of whatever, and you have to know very well when you are furious when you are angry, when you are enraged, not because you're a hostile person or a paranoid person or all those other uh, explanations of what's wrong with the soul inside the body, but because the soul inside the body is in connected to the world and finds true objects to be enraged about and to be afraid of. 